Attention, attention, all Area 51 stormers. That means you, Larry, put down the flamethrower. Before we storm the military's worst kept secret base, I want you to know that having 500,000 of you here really helps with my anxiety. The 20 guards who can fire 800 rounds a minute with their M16s won't be able to stop us all. Hey, where are y'all going? The Odd to New Finland Paranormal Podcast brings you the best in East Coast esoterica on the first of every month. Together, we can keep it growing by sharing the show on social media, subscribing to the show wherever you may be listening to it from, and by leaving feedback about your favorite episodes. Wait, what am I supposed to do with 500,000 egg salad sandwiches? The Odd to New Finland Paranormal Podcast. Always available. Always free. Always odd. It's the Odd, Odd, Odd to New Finland. Ghostly greetings from your host, Jonathan. Mysteries, ghosts, monsters, and lore. East Coast esoterica and so much more. If it's up to you, friend, it's on the up to you found line. <laughs> Closely greetings from the oldest city in North America. I'm your host, John Mallard, bringing you the best in East Coast, Esoterica. You, my friend, have stumbled upon the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast for the month of October 2019. Halloween is here! Welcome to episode 75 of your monthly paranormal variety show. And having your hair is better than, you know, fun in the last Snickers bar and your bag of candy when you were a kid. Or when you and your best friend used to dress up as the same thing for Halloween. So, so cool. And why is it so great to have you here? Because, you know, you're wonderful. A masterpiece. Beautifully made, important to people because you're important to me. Highly favored by your creator, whether that's God or by the law of averages and physics working in tandem. You, my friend, are an oddball. And here on this show, your family and we are one. Episode 75. Going to thank our sponsor right off the top. Got to say it. Thank you, Blip. Remember, guys, I'll do a little ad for them a little later in the show. But don't forget to check out my special URL to sign up for a free account. And you'll get a $25 Blip credit to help you get started at blipbillboards.com slash odd, blipbillboards.com slash O-D-D. Go check it out. There'll be a link down in the description of this show. And, uh, you know, they're our amazing sponsor. And I'm so excited because a little later in the month, I will be using Blip to advertise, well, the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast. <laughs> I just can't help myself. I got to do something for Halloween. I mean, Halloween is awesome. And I got to promote, you know, I, I guess standing in the corner dressing up as something scary and screaming at kids to listen to my podcast. It didn't really work last year. So, you know, this year we're trying something different, something classier. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Oh, man. Okay. So, wow. What a month. September was a month. <laughs> September wasn't easy. So let me right off the hop just say that unfortunately tonight we will not have Laura Sweenbert. Dr. Laura's lair will not be here on this episode. She has a lung infection. Yeah. So she just could not get the content together this month and she's very, very ill. She sounds even worse than I do because as you can probably tell, I sound a little off because I have the dreaded, you guessed it, cold oh and you know the show must go on the show must go on but a little later in the month i'm going to release dr laura's lair a very special halloween themed episode of it as bonus content along with another guest will be released as well and as it looks right now four mini episodes of oddities I mean, this month is going to be just full of content for you guys, so keep your eyes open. Yes, some of the podcasts are going to be three and four and five minutes long, but guess what? 
It's all about getting little little somethings out there, a little bit, little bit of extra stuff out there for you. I mean, it can be two or three minutes long and be awesome to listen to. And uh, some of the stuff I'm putting out is actually really, really fun. I've got the episodes actually ready to go as we speak right now. And I'm just working on the podcast art for all of it. Um, yeah, so I sound horrible. <laughs> If this is your first time listening to the podcast, I usually sound way better than this. A whole lot more masculine, a little less nasally, you know. Just just, just picture, like, Ron Perlman, you know, delivering this podcast to you. And uh, I'm, I'm sure you'll get the, the gist of it. <laughs> Workouts are still going on. Not going to lie. Been under a lot of stress. After a full year with us, my little foster baby boy... Went home on the 10th of September and, uh, you know, a, a very bittersweet moment. He's part of our family. He's beloved. And uh, it, it's very unfortunate that we have to part ways with these kids. It's, it's all part of the shtick, so to say, when it comes to being a foster parent. I mean, this is what it's all about. So he went home on the 10th. And then, unbeknownst to us, on the 12th. A new child came to stay with us. This is unheard of. Usually we have a month in between placements, so it kind of turned our world upside down. Uh, child's much higher needs than the last one we had, so it's, it's, it's definitely a different feeling, but it's God's work, and uh, whenever he calls you, it's usually a storm. <laughs> you keep that in mind this Halloween if the weather's rainy outside. You better go out and get all the candy you can, have as much fun as you can, doing what you love, and doing what you're loving to do, um, but we're adapting, it's been tough, uh, but you know what, sometimes you got to mourn on the run, and uh, you know, this podcast is for people who are mourning on the run, I wonder how many of you guys are out there, I bet you there's lots, there's lots of people, do you ever have to do that before, mourn on the run, you, you lost someone you love, but you still got to go because you're needed elsewhere, or, or, or a dream didn't work out, and you know, you don't have any time to mourn that dream because it didn't work out because you had to go on to something else. Take a breath, man. Take a breath. God's got a great plan for all of us. And if you don't believe in God, the law of averages states that you will eventually find new, more happiness in a new place. So there you go. We'll leave it at that. Halloween traditions. This is something somebody asked me in uh, on one of the pages, actually. You know, they want me to talk about some of the... Halloween traditions I used to do as a child, so, you know, to kind of celebrate the season, I thought it'd be kind of cool. I have a couple of different Halloween traditions. Uh, obviously, I'm more of a Christmas guy. You can tell by listening to my podcast over the last five years, but there is actually quite a, a an array of Halloween stuff because, believe it or not, with my family, because the paranormal is such an everyday thing, it, it's kind of... It's kind of more like the segue to Christmas with my family. So, you know, a movie like uh, The Nightmare Before Christmas is probably a must-watch for me and my daughter at some point. She usually watches the first 10 minutes of it and gets bored. I watch the whole thing. I just I just can't get enough. Um, and if you ever wonder who my favorites are in the in the whole thing, it's definitely Lock and Barrel. The little kids who try to kidnap uh, <laughs> Santa Claus. String up the Santa Claus, put them in a bag. <laughs> it's, it's deadly. <laughs> I love those guys. Um, but I have very fond memories of going out trick-or-treating every single year with my parents. And I also have fond memories of me and my buddies. Like, in junior high, we, we would still go out. And in fact, in junior high, it was 97 and 98 and 99, which were the biggest years for professional wrestling ever. And I can remember all of us were dressed up as members of the NWO one Halloween. And uh, it was just ridiculous. There was like 20 of us because the NWO was this huge wrestling faction. And I remember very fondly of being Buff Bagwell, who, by the way, is now a freelance male gigolo, who you could, you know, book if you really want to. So there you go, Buff Bagwell. I'm giving you a shout out <laughs> for this Halloween episode. <laughs> oh, my. So many things to get to and so little time. Over the last few months, I've covered some different stories. And it's time to finally get the answer to some of the mysteries we've been waiting on and some of the events that were coming. That's right. It's time for the Paranormal News. <laughs> Somewhere between the funnies <laughs> and, and the obituaries is... Oh, oh yes. <laughs> the 
Paranormal news. <laughs> those people go who said this summer they were going to be part of, you know, the whole Area 51 thing. <laughs> Did you know that only a few dozen people showed up to storm Area 51 after? After months of hype, barely anyone actually turned up to storm through the gates of the secretive facility. Millions signed up for it, but when push came to shove, very few were willing to go through with it. According to various reports, somewhere between 75 and 150 people actually turned up at the gates of Area 51 on the day of the actual storming of the base and it never materialized. Only one person was arrested, and that was for urinating near the gate. <laughs> the story was much the same for other mirror events, such as Storm Loch Ness. I'm a little disappointed because it's a lot less people than they said online, said Area 51 attendee Nathan Brown, who had driven 700 miles from Portland to attend the event. Originally billed as a tongue-in-cheek effort to determine if there are aliens at the secret of U.S. base, the event titled Storm Area 51, They Can't Stop All of Us, was originally posted on Facebook in July. It quickly became something of an internet phenomenon with 2.5 million sign-ups. Given the meager turnout, however, the event seems to have ended in more of a whimper than a bang. <laughs> so there you go. I'm done with this story. Hooray. But you know what? I'm so going to keep that bumper because, well... Let's be honest, it's just, it's just really, really good stuff. I love that whole story. I thought it was really, really cool. Maybe I'm just getting old. <laughs> but, you know, when there's a good, like, saga, like the Area 51 saga thing going on, I don't know. I think it's it's important that we, 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 we sit back and we just look at how close all these people came to actually being killed. And I'm glad that only 150 people went through with it because, let me tell you, there's a good chance that some of you guys who are there are probably listening to this podcast right now because you love everything paranormal. <laughs> but I'm so glad you didn't get shot and wind up, you know, in a wheelchair or something, especially if the wheelchair was haunted. A haunted wheelchair has been spooking staff at a hospital. Have you guys heard about this story? A recently published viral video shows a wheelchair seemingly moving all on its own at the hospital in India. The movement of the wheelchair, which has since sparked speculations of a ghostly presence, was first noticed by security guard Monaj Kumar. In a video that can be viewed online, the wheelchair starts to move at around 30 seconds in. While it's very easy to attribute the movement to wind, especially as the wheelchair was outside, some staff members were reportedly so spooked by the footage that they have since been reluctant to come into work for the night shift due to the possibility of supernatural presence and phenomena. One of us had gone for the rounds and another was inside, said Kumar. I came out to drink water and saw the wheelchair moving on its own. It was just, you know, wind, nothing else. I was also feeling very cold. It was very, very strange. And there you have it. Be careful where you sit down. You might just be sitting in, well, a haunted wheelchair. <laughs> oh, Texas, you're always afraid of something. There's a Texas Chainsaw Massacre, of course, but you know what? This month saw something very, very strange indeed as a mystery primate terrorizes Texas residents. Multiple witnesses have reported seeing a large primate lurking in the streets of the southern state. The creature, which has been described as some kind of monkey, has been seen on numerous occasions in the city of Santa Fe, with one witness even claiming it tried to make off with a cat. Another witness, Patricia De La Mora, called the police in the early mornings of Monday morning to report that she had seen a large primate from her window after hearing strange noises outside. I look out the window and I see it was in there, she said. It was a monkey, a big one. He tried to find something. He looked over there. He looked over there. And I closed the curtain. I don't want to see him. I closed the curtain. This is all, of course, translated. According to reports, officers searched the area for an hour but failed to find any sign of the creature. However... The very next day, they received another report from someone else living nearby. Just had a monkey try to attack me while checking my mail, the witness said. <laughs> I spent the last 20 minutes in my car. <laughs> As before, no evidence the creature could be found. Residents have been warned to stay away from the animal. If they happen to encounter it. Efforts to track it down are still underway. That is creepy! 
but like, you know, in a monkey kind of way, I, I, I don't know. I always see monkeys as mischievous anyway, but man, oh man, what's one doing in Texas? What's going on in Texas, man? Come on. Well, we've been following this story now for, for quite some time, really. Let's be honest, this has been months. And the Loch Ness study finally came out this month. The results of a biological study of Loch Ness have revealed a possible explanation for the elusive monster. The study, which was led by New Zealand geneticist Professor Neil Gemmell, involved in analyzing the DNA contained within 250 samples of Loch Ness water to determine what is living in there. Part of the study also involved investigating the validity of various monster hypotheses, such as whether or not the creature could be a prehistoric reptile, a sturgeon, or even a giant catfish. Now, at last, after teasing the study's findings last month, Professor Gemmel has finally revealed the most plausible explanation of the Loch Ness Monster. Truly is giant eels. Interesting. This conclusion is remarkably timely, given that, that you know, there's actually footage of the river nest showing a large eel-like creature that came out earlier in the month. There's no shark DNA in Loch Ness based on our sampling, said Gemmel. There's also no catfish DNA in Loch Ness based on our sampling. We can't find any evidence of sturgeon either. There is a very significant amount of eel DNA, though. Eels are very plentiful in Loch Ness. With eel DNA found at pretty much every location sampled, there are a lot of them. So, are they giant eels? Is this really the question here, folks? Well... Our data doesn't reveal their size, unfortunately, but the sheer quantity of the material says that we can't discount the possibility that there may be giant eels in Loch Ness. Therefore, we can't discount the possibility that people see and believe is the Loch Ness Monster might very well be one of these giant eels. I think that's absolutely fascinating, but we have a problem with that hypothesis, and anybody who's familiar with the Loch Ness Saga and, and the people who've been on my shows talking about it have talked about a large neck creature rising out of the water and also seeing it on land. So perhaps there's more to this than meets the eye. But if it does come out that it truly is a large eel or a new species of eel that gets discovered, it's still a cryptid because it hasn't been discovered. And that is so cool. Let's hope that we truly are one step closer to finding that Loch Ness Monster. Tree fitty. Moving on. I just couldn't help myself because my wife loves this show. But did you know that Downton Abbey is haunted by a footman's ghost? The owner of High Clare Castle, okay, which is, you know, the real life Downton Abbey, has spoken out about its haunted past. According to Lady Fiona Carnarvon, the iconic building which was made world famous by the world popular TV series Downton Abbey TV show, was once home to the ghost of a footman who killed himself. On one occasion, she recalled seeing a figure dressed in black in the castle's basement while she had been posing for photographs alongside her three-year-old son, Edward, who was driving a toy car. I turned and I saw a man coming towards us out of the gloom, she said. He seemed slightly undefined. I told him to go faster, but he went at his own pace. I simply pushed him along and burst through the swing doors. The figure paused at the door and I just hurried along. Keen to remove the ghostly presence, Carnarvon called in the Anglican monk to bless the building. Her decision seemed to have paid off, as the figure has never been seen again since. I assumed it worked, she said, but I don't think the area is necessarily wholly without ghosts. Sure enough, several others have reported paranormal encounters within the castle walls. Even her own father once reported seeing a well-dressed lady roaming the building's halls. It's an old house, so there are the inevitable groans and stories that come along with such a place. And you know, what's a good Halloween without a good Halloween story, right? Well, the world's largest occult library is going online, baby! Bust out the Libby app if you're in Canada. We're going to learn us some devil worship. A vast library of more than 25,000 occult texts have been scanned and published on the internet for free. Founded by Juice Rittman, Amsterdam's Bibliothetical Philosophical Hermeteca, <laughs> try saying that three times fast, also known as the Rittman Library, contains tens of thousands of texts relating to a wide range of occult topics. The volumes contained within the collection cover such subjects as Hermeteca, alchemy, mysticism, gnosticism, esotericism, anthropophysity. 
Freemasonry, and comparative religion, among many others. The library contains numerous rare works, as well as thousands predating the 19th century. Most recently, in a renewed bid to preserve these texts and make them more accessible, the library has been working to digitize the core collection and make it available for viewing online. Known as the Hermetically Open Archive, the online collection can be found online. Just look it up. That's the Hermetically Open Archive. H-E-R-M-E-T-I-C-A-L-L-Y, Open Archive. And you know what? This summer may be dead and gone, but this Halloween we might be raising the dead. <laughs> Guys, it's been a wild month. We had very few people showing up to Area 51. My goodness gracious. Didn't work out like we thought it was. We have a potential solution to the Loch Ness Monster, which I think is great. Downton Abbey is freaking haunted. And, you know, the old cult library is kind of going online. Even the devil's, you know, the total millennial now. <laughs> Guys, all these stories have been odd to Newfoundland. Welcome everyone, Betty your Oracle here with the October edition of Words of Wisdom for your consideration and enjoyment. The first thing I want to talk about is October. October itself. What is the what is this month about? So in looking up, you know, in surfing the web, I kind of looked across different search engines and I found October is Computer Learning Month, is International Dinosaur Month, Raptor Month. I'm not sure if they mean the dinosaur or that sports team. <laughs> I'm not much into sports, as you, as you might have gathered by now. This is Bullying Prevention Month. This is ADHD Awareness Month. This is Learning Disabilities Month. And also in this month... We have Halloween. There are, there is so much about Halloween that I could talk about right now, but I'm not going to do that. Not for, the, not right at this very minute. Simply because I want to talk about what I did last year. A podcast last year. I did a meditation for you, and the meditation was all about protection around the dark energies that that are around during Halloween, but it's four dark energies that are around anyway, because where there's light, there's dark. As above, so below. There has to be dark in order to be light. So what I'm going to do this month, this month of, and, you know, the season of, as Winnie the Pooh would call them, heffalumps and woozles and all things spooky, I just want to remind you, with a really quick, just close your eyes, see that golden light, imagine that golden light, imagine it growing and growing and growing to encompass you in protection, golden bubble of protection, just for you. Feel how warm and comfortable it feels in there. And this is, I would say, less than a minute and a half it will take you to do this. So, as I talk to you then about the word fear, because there's a lot of fear surrounding anything that seems to be dark or unknown, and a lot of people associate the unknown with fear. Google says fear is a feeling induced by perceived danger or threat. Not necessarily the actual danger or threat, perceived danger or threat that occurs in certain types of organisms, which causes a change in metabolic and organ functions, and ultimately a change in behavior, such as fleeing, hiding, or freezing, from perceived traumatic events. The fear arises from the perception of danger, 
confrontation with or escape from avoiding the threat in which, in extreme cases, fear can be a freeze response or paralysis. I have seen unfounded fear to be devastating. People who hate highway driving because of the moose, automatically you're putting fearful thoughts in your head because you think that moose is out there to get you. When in actual fact, if you totally forgot about that moose and drove out that highway with your radio on or or your music playing and enjoyed the ride, there would be no fear. If the if if you took the idea that those moose are out there to get us, because that's they that's where the fear comes from. So when we say, "Oh, I can't drive on that highway because too many moose," well, the moose are probably saying, "Like those cars are really bothering us." So one versus the other, the moose don't fear us as much as we. Well, I guess they do. They fear us as much as we fear them because I'm quite sure they've seen their brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers. <sighs> whatever brought down so enough about the moose but people who you know there's the fear of flying for instance and but people can't tell you why they're afraid people are afraid of wind people are afraid of heavy rain people are afraid and they can't tell you why but as a coach um i am a life coach five years ago actually i was in ontario doing my life coaching course And as that coach, I see most fears being brought forward from past lives because you can't explain it. And if it's something that you're absolutely afraid of that you cannot explain, where did it come from? It's a memory. What memory? Can you remember it in this lifetime? Did you actually go through any of this? And I'm one of the who's of the firm belief as well. That, you know, you get to a certain age in your life. So I just reached that big milestone of 65 years, 65 years old. And I understand and I know I have always been taken care of my entire life. I have been led in this direction. I have been led in that direction. And yes, I have also had opportunities, huge opportunities that went missed. And that was by choice. So we get to choose our lives and we get to choose whether we are fearful or not. And if you're fearful about any issue at all, it wouldn't hurt to sit down with yourself and go inside and find out where that fear comes from. And if you can't find out where that fear comes from, then you could Take yourself to a past life regressionist. Uh, My hand is up over here because I do that as well. And get that feeling removed. Get that fear removed. I have lots of tricks up my sleeve for for removing fear. So let's let's get into this month of October. And in particular, Halloween. Because this, of course, is the Paranormal Podcast. So... When I talk about Halloween, the very first thing I want to do, and the very first thing I think is, <laughs> she came last year, this witch. She's not here this year. Um, I just ad- adapted her voice. She doesn't need to be here. She's here all the time. So my main topic for this month of October in our lead up to Halloween is cemeteries. I love cemeteries. The most peaceful place in the world. I got a couple of stories for you about cemeteries. When my father was in his mid 80s, my dad has been passed now 16 years and he's quite he's quite all right with me telling you what I'm going to tell you now. So when he was in his mid 80s, a very old cemetery in the city where mom and dad lived found 100 plots that were actually empty. This is a very old cemetery and a lot of people in our area know where it is. It's the Anglican Cemetery on Forest Road for anybody from here. 
There are headstones behind mom and dad's uh, grave plot that go back to the 1800s. So they found these hundred plots. And long story short, that mom and dad bought their their plot. In in it, it happened to be their very favorite cemetery. Did I just say cemetery or cemetery? <laughs> I guess I guess the little uh, goblins and things that go bump in the night are coming towards me. Anyway, during those years that remained before he passed, every single time we would pass that cemetery, my father would crane his neck and point, and he'd say, "That's me new bed in there." And I, all I could do was laugh and say, Dad, I have never seen anyone who wants to get into the ground as bad as you do. And now my father was a really good gardener, as well as being a fisherman. He, his hands were always in the ground. But his comeback was always the same. Whenever I would say that to him, he'd come back with, sure, they're all dying to get in there. <laughs> This cemetery is is a very old, old Anglican cemetery. And as I said, it's on Forest Road. So it's in the east end of the city. And the headstones dating back years. And I, my love for cemeteries, especially at night when it's really calm, the cemetery is generally calmer than anywhere else in the city. Unless, you know, there are those who like to vandalize about or or whatever. And since I've done a course in paranormal rescue, I love cemeteries even more. John and I have had the conversation about his paranormal investigation. I do paranormal rescue. So going into a cemetery for me is a very peaceful place. And I'm sure several of you are saying, why is a cemetery is peaceful? The only, the only one I know that I probably wouldn't be at peace in, in, sitting in at night. There's one in the west end of St. John's that has most of its graves lit. So people have these little little uh, LED lights on, their, on, on, on the grave markers or the headstones, I guess, to light the way for their loved one. They probably don't realize that their loved one is not actually below that earth. Their loved one's soul left shortly after they passed. That's, that soul did not go to that cemetery. That soul was long gone back to the light. So the light in these cemeteries, the people that put these lights on their loved one's headstones, in actual fact, the light is for them because it lights their heart to think that their loved one is being lit uh, their way home. Their way home was lit and was programmed and was asked for and was adopted before they even came here. And a lot of people won't believe that. A lot of people that's that's a load of honkum, bonkum. It's not. Um, I've done a lot of research. I've done I've done a lot of education in learning about past lives, about the fact that it isn't nothing is as it seems to be. We we are exactly where we are supposed to be every single minute of our lives. We're always taken care of, even in the cemetery. You could sit in, you go, you go, any of you, go sit in a cemetery at dusk and wait till it gets dark and feel the peace. Because on almost every one of those headstones, you're going to see three letters, if not the words. R, I, P. Rest in peace. So, this body, this body that I prefer to call this meat suit, because that's where we're flesh and bone that, and, and water is this, is this shell that our soul is, is in. 
or that our soul is carrying. Because there is a school of thought that our soul is within us. And then there's another school of thought that we are within our soul. Pick your choice. The soul leaves the body when the body is no longer functioning. That's not when it's brought to the cemetery. Generally, when someone passes, there's at least a 12-hour, if not a 24-hour period before they actually are buried, cremated, whatever the case may be. And even if they're taken from a hospital bed to the crematorium and right away cremated, the soul is not cremated. The soul has already left. And I saw that for myself on more than one occasion. I've sat with, I sat with my father when he died, with my mother when she died, with my father-in-law when he died, with, you know, I stood beside my grandmother's, my grandmother's, I want to say body, mount, and yes, it was the body of my grandmother after she passed as a little girl, just sitting there, just standing there and being told I was 12 years old and there was a funeral home full of people. So, of course, being number five of six children, I was taken by the shoulders, planked in front of my grandmother and said, stay there. I was told, stay there, don't move. So there, it wasn't traumatic for me at all. It was just watching my nan sleep. But my nan wasn't even there. My nan was probably, in actual fact, standing behind me, keeping that fear away. So... Why would anyone go to a cemetery and look for spirits? So when John and I had that conversation, he told me that in his paranormal investigation, he has has had uh, EVPs from, and so that's basically he's being talked to by spirit from the, from cemeteries. And as I said to him, it, absolutely, indeed, because who... Who's to say that 200 years ago, that same ground where that cemetery is, was not a prison, was not, it could have been a prison, it could have been, it could have been a battleground, it, any number of things could have happened on that property, anybody could have died, any spirit could be stuck in that cemetery from the 1500s, from the 1600s, who knows, who knows? But I do know this, when my when I pass, I ain't going to be looking for this meat suit. And the only spirit that would be in a cemetery of all of those, all of those beautiful headstones, people who are memorialized by these headstones, it's just their name and their essence. It's not their soul that's in that ground. Not at all. Not at all. Another story about cemetery. So the year after my my dad passed, my dad was 10 years older than my mom. The year after he passed, uh, it was the anniversary of my father's passing. It was the first year anniversary. There was also a family gathering that day. So and fa- um, a family gathering of sorts. A lot of family had come home from away, and now that was the day they were leaving to go home, as well as this little gathering taking place. So one of my sisters, who was here for my father's funeral, called and, you know, said goodbye, and we should honor the day reverently by going to the cemetery. So, and she said that's according to our other brother, who was home as well from away. So I said to her, when I was talking to her, I said, okay, you have a safe trip home. Whatever mom wants to do, we will do. So I went out to to my family home and walked in through the door. And mom was like a stick of chewing gum all ready to go. And she looked lovely. So I said, mom, you want to go to the cemetery first? Or do you want to go to the, out, out to the family? And she put her hands on her hips and she looked at me and she said, what are we going to the cemetery for? And I said, okay, well, according to my sister, according to my brother, we are supposed to honor the day reverently by going to the cemetery. 
<laughs> Here's why my wise little mother at 78 years old, 79 years old, saying, uh, where's your brother? He's out in the country with my other brother. Where's your sister? She's on a plane on the way to, on the way to Toronto. She said, for heaven's sake, we're going out to family. Your father is not going to know if we were there or not. <laughs> and she was right. Dad actually probably knew we weren't there. And Dad, it's not that Mom didn't like cemeteries. She would go with me every time. When my dad passed, I was the one who took care of Dad's. I'd put flowers and I'd put, I'd put a hosta from their garden and whatnot in there. And after that, when Mom passed, every single time now I turn into that Anglican cemetery or try to turn into that Anglican cemetery, I can hear Mom saying, don't you dare. Mom understood that a cemetery is a resting place for a physical body, not a soul, not a soul. All our souls are beaming bright. And before... I end, and before I send you back to John, I like extraterrestrial anything as well. So paranormal, extraterrestrial, I believe in it all. I have a book here called From Outer Space to You. And this poem, and it's a poem, was written by C.B. Braley. God's World. The windswept hills lie robbed, robed in red. The windswept hills lie robed in red, where fiery leaflets fell, and moonbeams dance a fantasy on brook and wooded dell. Night creatures scurry through the brush, intent to reach their lair. The birds of flight are lost tonight. The world retreats from care. The scent of wood smoke from below. The dirt distant church bells roll. Seals close the mantle of the night. Or man in his fettered roll. Within man's soul and lighted frame, the omniscient light grows bright. Received by some who know not truth as the beauty of the night. Man's conscious state sees not the light that feeds his very soul. Despite his loss in his earthly trek and the lack of a cosmic role, the ego and power that men proclaim draws tight the blinds of night. Against the ever awakening dawn of God's eternal light. Look out and see God's world sublime, its radiance of many a hue. Look in and know the world divine that came to those who knew. Know God's world as not a sphere but the realms of space unknown, where dwells the light of love for all, and God's great works are sown. Have a fabulous month, everybody. Back to you, John. Attention all Podbean, iTunes, Stitcher, and TuneIn Radio listeners. The Odd to Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast brings you the best in East Coast esoterica on the first of every month. Together, we can keep it growing by sharing the show on social media, subscribing to the show wherever you may be listening to it from, and by leaving feedback about your favorite episodes. John certainly needs a friend like you to help make his dreams come true, minus the alien abduction dreams. That is not cool at all. The Odd to Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast. Always available. Always free. Always odd. Before I get started with tonight's amazing guest, the whole premise of this podcast is about discovering things that are out of the ordinary. The odd, so to speak. I've recently found a service that helps businesses stand out, just like me, from the crowd. It's called Blip Billboards. They help businesses of any size with any budget. 
get seen on large format digital billboards. For me, seeing my podcast on a big billboard to get the word out was a dream come true. I never thought I'd be able to afford it in a million years. How could I ever afford advertising on billboards? But thanks to Blip and their pay-what-you-want approach, this dream is a reality that truthfully didn't cost me a whole lot. It didn't take too much of my time. All you have to do is pick the billboards you'd like to advertise on, set your daily schedule and budget, then upload your ad design. Once your ad is approved, your ad will be live for everyone to see. Blip Billboards is great for standing out locally or boosting awareness nationally. So whether you're a small tech startup, a local restaurant, or anywhere in between, your business can now afford to make these big impressions in the locations that matter to you. What would your billboard say? Try Blip Billboards today. Go to my special URL to sign up for a free account, and you'll get a $25 Blip credit to help you get started at blipbillboards.com slash odd. That's blipbillboards.com slash odd. B-L-I-P-B-I-L-L-B-O-A-R-D-S dot com slash odd. Welcome back to the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast, your monthly paranormal variety show. Tonight's guest is going to go through a little journey through the gate. Yeah, that's right. Have you ever seen a ghost? Maybe seen a shadow person from the corner of your eye? Perhaps heard the woods get quiet and have a chill run up your spine? Or wondered how psychics can use their gifts? You know what? It sounds to me like you're on a journey to the gate yourself. Tonight's guest, someone who's kind of experienced a lot of the paranormal and is a beloved paranormal, fellow paranormal podcaster. Her name is Cisco Murdoch, and she's on the Odd the Newfoundland paranormal podcast how do you tonight cisco uh so great to be here you know I, the travel didn't hurt at all it was <laughs> easy pass to get all the way over there it's just awesome to be here thanks for having me on i know right i i totally summoned you here i i drew like a little pentagram and i and i and i like put a big bottle of like tennessee whiskey there and you know speaking of whiskey yeah. tell us about how you used to serve a ghost <laughs> Because this is the best story I ever heard you tell me already. But please tell my listeners this. Well, absolutely. Well, I, I was a bartender for a lot of years. I've been a lot of different things. I was a single mom with two boys. So, you know, sometimes I had two full-time jobs at once. But one of the best jobs I ever had is being a bartender. And I've bartended in a lot of different little clubs and big fancy clubs. But this one, um, I was a manager and full-time bartender at a motel, hotel, really nice. I don't want to say the name. It's a big chain. But, uh, you know, all the chains are really franchises and they're all just a little different. And this one had a, a cool bar in it. And uh, the kitchen was closed because it was remodeling. And uh, so it didn't get a lot of traffic, but it got just enough, you know, during the week. And we were right across from the Army base that I retired out of. And... Uh, being, you know, a soldier that just got out of the army, I could relate to a lot of the people that were on TDY there. And, um, uh, they used to come and stay, you know, anytime from like one to two weeks to a couple months. And then you'd have the regulars in town as well. So the reason I'm telling that is when you get to know somebody that comes in, they have the regular stuff. I'll have a beer, give me the bowl of peanuts, and then they'll order a hamburger, go back to their room. They all have a little routine and, in a small place like that, you have a little time to talk to people, too, so you get to know a little bit about their families back home or what they're doing on their job on the base or, you know, just chit-chat. Well, in this particular bar, um, like I said, the, the locals would come in, you know, your regulars, and then you'd have the ones that were staying over. And I started to notice a pattern, and the pattern was basically – Sometimes the people would automatically change personality wise, even somewhat the way they, their body language, their features. This one guy came in and he had been there off and on a couple of weeks. He didn't come in every day, but regular enough. And he just, he was tired of doing his job. He just wanted to go home and he was a great dad. And he had, I think a couple little girls, a little boy. And he was telling me this story about how he put together the swing set and he got a picture of them playing on the swing set. He just really homesick, you know, guy. And he was always extremely polite. He always came in and ordered a beer. He'd usually order something from the takeout menu, get it delivered and take it up to his room and repeat his day, you know? And this one day he's telling me the story and he's really tired. And he kept saying he was hungry 
And uh, I just gave him some takeout menus. And I'm putting the caps on the bottles, setting up the bar. And I'm looking in the mirror and I'm talking to him as I'm looking in the mirror, you know, bartenders do. And I notice this just like kind of a gray smudgy spot on the mirror. And I thought, made a metal note, man, I got to clean that mirror. And I'm still talking to him. And all of a sudden, his whole body language just kind of changed. He slapped his hands down on the bar and he put his head down. He looked up at me. And I turned around and looked at him. He said, shot of tequila, no salt. I was kind of taken back. I never saw this guy drink hard liquor. Never, never. A beer, maybe two. That's it. And his whole, everything, his demeanor, everything changed. And I was just kind of taken aback. And I said, uh, you have a preference there, you know? And he said, gold. All right. I'll go over and get the Cuervo and the board the shot, put it in front of him. And by now, he's standing up and he's rolling up his sleeves. And I mean, I'd never seen this guy act this way before. I mean, his his voice even seemed to sort of change, at least the way he was speaking did. And I set the shot down in front of him, and he just picked it up and shot it right down, slammed it down, reached in his pocket, started fumbling around his pockets. And he put some money up on the bar, and he said, and he changed for the pool table. Was, you know, okay. Actually, he didn't say that. He said, change pool table, like just like that, change pool table. Okay. <laughs> Never saw play pool either. Got the change out of my tip jar, gave it to him. He put some in the jukebox, started playing some music. And then he went over, started dancing with the pool stick and stuff. And I'm like, I've never seen this dude act like this. Right. And I just, you know, shaking it off a little bit. And I go around, keep setting up the bar and I'm keeping an eye on him. And cause it's so odd, but you, you just keep going through your motions. You know, you don't just stop and go, Oh, you know, what's going on with you? You know, until something really starts to happen. So I'm watching him and it's, pretty darn good shot. I mean, he proceeds to just wipe out this pool table, you know, just shot after shot after shot. So I'm getting some beer and everything else. And another couple came in and I'm still keeping an eye on him. I was back up to the bar, got another shot of tequila. Same thing. Shot of tequila, no salt. Okay. Gave it to him. He goes over and he plays another. There's probably four people in this bar. So he's playing by himself. And I'm just watching him dance to the music and all this other stuff. And I'm like, what is going on? And I go in the back to get some more beer to put in the cooler. And when I come in, he's sitting down at the bar, like all the air had just gone out. And he's got his head down on the bar and everything. And I said, hey, dude, you know, man, are you okay? Uh, you still want me to get you something to eat? Because, you know, you really should eat something. Because now, I'm, you know, I'm thinking he's got a half a beer. He's got two shots of tequila. And he was starving when he came in. He said, Man, my head really hurts. And his voice and his demeanor, everything is back, right? And I said, uh, you know, you probably don't want to finish this. Let me get you something else, you know. And he said, man, my head is really, really killing me. I see, he said, just, just a tab. I just want to pay and get out. So I go over to the register where I write everything down and, you know, keeping the tabs. And I look up in the mirror and I see behind him, this like gray, misty, wasn't very big, maybe the size of a basketball. It wasn't round. It was just like floaty, kind of dusty, gray, misty thing. And it was kind of hovering right behind him. And then all of a sudden it just shot, went around the pool table and went into where the kitchen was closed in, in right in the doors. Doors didn't move. It went through the doors, like double doors of the kitchen. It was gone. And at that point in time, I realized. When I looked down at the tab, I just scratched off the shots of tequila. I said, man, beer's on me. I'll order you a burger to your room. I said, you go up to your room. I'll have it sent up there for you. And he said, thanks, Cisco. I really appreciate it. And It was almost like you had an actual, almost like a little mini possession thing go on there. Yeah, it was a jumper. He had a jumper. Yeah, so Did tell me a little have- tiny bit about that. <laughs> like, uh <laughs> This spirit, so you're saying this spirit, has he done it to anybody else or has just been this one guy? Well, see, that's the thing. You know, if you if you think about it, okay, at that point in time, I mean, that was probably, I was right after I was in the Army. I mean, I had to be like in the 80s, late 80s, right? So I I was aware of these things. I had had experiences throughout my life. But I wasn't really surrounded by the people I'm surrounded by now. You can't really, you know, just go, 
you know, to your best friend, hey, you know, what do you know about ghosts or what's going on? You don't really talk about it unless you have a like minded person that, you know, you can talk about it to. I didn't know the mediums and psychics and, you know, paranormal investigators and things that I know now. So I'm looking at it. And I'm trying to decipher it all with just my knowledge, you know, the things that I had collected in through time. And I knew um, that there was things, you know, as far as being, you know, possessed or um, ha- possibly having a jumper like that. That's what I called them. I've always called them jumpers since that time. It's like, man, I got another jumper here, you know. But and when you're in a work environment, you know, nobody else is talking about it. I heard a couple of people say, you know, this place is haunted. There's stuff that goes on here. And I'd say, oh, really? What? And then they tell you little stories. But nothing like this. But because I was in this bar pretty much by myself from opening to close because I managed the place, you know, I was able to observe and I did have other people throughout time, probably the year and a half I was there, that that affected uh, in that way. But, you know, if you're in a crowd and it's a big Friday night, you're not going to notice something like this. But in this case, that's when I really started to zero in on it. When I saw the mist, when I saw this guy that I, you know, knew fairly well change like that. And it really affected me to the point of I'm thinking, you know, man, you know, uh, not all blackouts are due to alcohol. I mean, if it's this easy for something like that, uh, an entity or a human ghost, I was I thought it was a human ghost. Um, that has this knowledge to be able to do this and the want to do it, you know, pretty much anybody is an open target, you know, especially when you're drinking and stuff. So that, you know, that's something that really intrigued me, you know, and it'll make you not do a lot of shots. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking this, like, if that's the case, everyone in Newfoundland, which is, you know, let's be honest, like Diet Coke, Ireland, <laughs> that's pretty much where I'm from. I mean, everyone here is probably possessed. There's actually a really good chance. <laughs> like, you know, when I started to get into it, there was a couple of incidents there. I mean, I, I tell it in the book um, just on how this can happen. I've seen it happen before and I've seen it happen, especially, you know, friends that have told me about, you know, paranormal investigation. Things have tried to jump them and stuff like this. But it seemed to me that this um, ghost just had this down. It had the ability. And I've learned since that, you know, some, you know, absolutely know that they're dead, have no they're not moving. They're familiar with their surroundings. They like the taste of alcohol. They can't have it themselves, but they when they can jump into somebody who's got a weakness, whether it be depression or in this case, this guy was tired. He was depressed because he was homesick. Um, he didn't have that much beer. I don't think it's because the alcohol, um, I, I say put cracks in your windshield, you know, like cracks in your aura or whatever protection. Um, I think it was because he was depressed and tired, you know, down, and maybe he was an easy target at that point in time. I mean, I've seen, uh, whether the mist was there or not, I've seen stuff just go right down a whole full bar, you know, smack one, pinch another, knock a chair over, and do something else, just like this whole boom, 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 down the bar. I've seen that. And this particular one, always, like you'll see an old one of the last ones I saw before I left was um, <laughs> this older lady comes in dressed really nice, you know, and I don't know if she's wearing pearls or not, but it was that kind of thing. She was an older lady and just well put together. And she's sitting there talking to her friend. It was a couple of office people in there. And the bartender that was taken over for me, I was just counting out tips. You know, you split tips when you're. You know, your shift is over and the next one's going to take over. And I'm standing there doing that at the end of the bar. And this lady who was so prim and proper, you know, talking to her office friends, bellies up to the bar and looks at my bartender friend and says, shot of tequila, no salt. And it said it in a way that it was not her persona at all. And I had to get somewhere. And what do you do? You look at the bartender, go, listen, there's a jumper. There's a ghost in here that jumps people. I mean, you don't you don't explain stuff like that. <laughs> like how, do you, how do you even start the conversation? Oh, listen, yeah. uh. By the way, uh, we can't let anybody leave this bar too intoxicated or you might get into an accident. And uh, and we had this jumper ghost. It's not a big deal. Just don't charge <laughs> yeah. for the tequila in the pool. <laughs> well, see, what I actually did was at one point, I, I, right on the tip of my tongue was, she's going to want pool change for the pool table. So here, have these quarters, you know. But I didn't say anything. You know, it's like I had to go. Um, I had another guy, same thing, you know, was in there with like a like an office group or whatever. And he wasn't even drinking. He was doing cranberry and something else. I can't remember what it was now, but 
He ordered it like it was a drink, too. It was one of those people, you know. I'll have, you know, a cranberry juice with a spritz of, you know, something else just to make it sound like he was drinking, but he no no alcohol. And the next thing you know, I go up, shot a tequila, no salt. I saw it several times in that bar. And I've heard since from, you know, medium psychics, uh, people that I've learned over many, many, many years to trust what they say because I've watched them a long time. You know, like uh, Echo Bodine. Uh, I love her. And she'll tell you right there with, um, oh, what's the name of that bar? Ooh, it's right on the tip of my tongue. It's a country bar, really haunted. Uh, Bobby Max. Bobby Mackey's? She was in there. And she was telling a story. And she was there to see what was going on and try to help. She's real big and trying to cross over. And... She went upstairs to one of the sections of the bar where the, I guess there was food. She wanted to get some ice water because she was just really drained from what she had been doing. And in comes from out of the corner, she could see these four, um, ghosts that are coming in. And basically that she called them jumpers too. She said that they're there. They had no intention of crossing, knew they were dead, didn't want to go anywhere else. They like to fight. They like to start bar fights. They like to drink. They like to, you know, have that whole life experience in death. And I've heard many other people talk about it, too. But isn't that weird <laughs> to think about that? I like to I'd stop you right there and just tell everybody, like, the reason why I didn't give Cisco a big introduction and, and get her to talk about where she's from or, or what her background of it is, I want you guys to hear that passion in her voice that comes through on her own podcast. And uh, there's no doubt that it's just, it's just, it, it, some people got it. Some people don't. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say that there's podcasters out there. God love their hearts for what they do, but the, you can just hear their voice. They just don't have it. You, my friend have it. Okay. Thank you, darling. I can hear it. Now you got Thank the passion you. and you obviously have a knowledge base. So let's talk a little tiny bit about that. Let's go back in time. Now, I don't want to go all the way back to baby Cisco unless we absolutely have to. <laughs> baby baby right? Cisco had a lot of experiences, though, hon. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, maybe we do. But I'd just like to know what it was that got you involved with the paranormal and uh, was, what kind of brought you to this this part of your life where you're now doing the podcasting thing just like me. Well, in a nutshell, if I can do that. My nutshells are kind of huge, though, so hang on. That's okay. We're trying to fill time. <laughs> Kill her. <laughs> Give it to her. <laughs> Never been a problem for me. Never been a problem for Didn't me. Didn't notice at all. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing, well, I think it's the same. And I say that in the book, too. I try to explain in my foreword that every, the things that draw us here are, are really very similar. Most everybody wants to know what happens to us when we die. And I don't care how many people you talk to. It's going to be theory. It's going to be guesswork. It's going to be what settles on their heart that they're okay with, you know? So all we can do is throw out ideas and tell people what's happened to us and what we've heard. That's it. It's theory and it's a little faith. It's a little um, hope, you know? And I think what draws us here too is, you know, the death of a loved one, you know, and hoping that we see them again, or are they okay? Whether it be a pet or a family member or friend, um, or it's just, you know, fear or, a wonderment of the whole thing. You know, what happens? What's going on? You know, are there really portals? Are there other dimensions? What's this time slip stuff? You know, that's just wonderment. And it's awesome. And if you have an experience that you're trying to explain. And when I was young, we didn't have the things we have now, we didn't have this vast internet of knowledge and being able to reach out to like minded. It's very much like I said earlier, we had to search for it. We had to talk to elders that would talk to us, you know, and I had many of those talks. Uh, look, I'm lucky enough to be Native American as well. So I, uh, that was always cool to sit around and talk to that elder, rarely spoke, but you ask them and they tell you these things. It's wonderful to learn, you know, and I saw it. From every corner, you know, I've talked to priests, I've talked to nuns, I've talked to Baptist preachers, I've talked to librarians, I've talked to, you know, the old man down the road, you know, I sat on porches, I, you know, talked to people, tell me your stories. Um, and I just wanted to know, 
what's going on? You know, did you ever have a loved one come and visit you in a dream or in your bedroom or before they died? You know, you know, I mean, right after they died or right before even I've, I've heard that, you know, and I was just very inquisitive. I wanted to understand. I wanted to understand what happened to me when I was little. I wanted to understand, you know, I lost so many people when I was young. Um, I was the youngest of um, nine and all the people were so much older than me when I was born. So I lost a lot of people very early in life, including my mother and father. And you just want to settle, whether it's settle the grief or settle the ache a little bit, uh, calm the pain. We're going to be all right, you know, and even if we're not, what can we do about it? You know, but uh, I had a lot of experiences. And I wanted to understand what did I see? Um, can I see it again? You know, do I want to see it again? You know, those kind of things. And I think that's the same reason that people like the ghost stories or like the cryptid stories or, you know, like the, you know, afterlife or NDE stories, haunted anything, because we're all searching for answers and we're never going to get them <laughs> until we get, you know, to the other side, maybe not even then, you know, but at least we can try to decipher and pick apart a little bit, you know, some people like to, car- you know, compartmentalize things, you know, put them in a little file system. But I found out a long time ago, you better make sure that you've got a lot of files because some of them bleed into the next and, you know, but it's just, gosh, it's like, it's like seeking treasure and finding little gold coins along the way, but you never find the whole big box, you know, but it's seeking it. That's the excitement of it, you know, and talking to cool people like you. Huh. I'm cool today. I like that. <laughs> oh, you're deadly. You're now deadly. I feel good. Deadly means deadly. good Newfoundland. I taught that to you a little while ago. <laughs> you got to say that for me. I practice it all day. I just. This is going to be deadly. But deadly. Bye. Bye. Deadly. Bye. bye. There you go. I love that. That's just sexy. Hey, bye. Right. Okay. So let's talk a little tiny. You know, I, I got to throw this out there. You know, sometimes there's a lot in just a name. And uh, mm-hmm. some people forget that when it comes to the names of our shows and stuff like that. All right. Journey through the gate. com is where you can find her beloved podcast, Journey Through the Gates podcast. <laughs> Tell me a little tiny bit about Journey Through the Gate. What exactly does that mean? Like to me, that like, oh my God, like, is this the gate to a haunted house? Is this yeah. the the gate to another oh, dimension? It, what, what? Okay, I wanted beyond the gate, but it was taken. Okay. And I'm one, and one of those people that I'm cool enough not to rip off other people. You know, it was just like, it was a tiny little podcast, probably radio show. And I'm like, no. So I was trying to find something. And I'm like, well, it's really a journey because, uh, I had, like I said, the elders talk to me and they're Native Americans are real big about talking about our journey, our journey here, continuing on the journey. It's, you know, they don't look at death as the end. They look at your continuing your journey. And that was always very comforting to me and also, you know, kind of cool. And I, I really liked that. And I said, well, we are kind of going through the gate or a portal or the other side. I don't really know what to call it. So it's just that it's like, what's on the other side of the gate, man? You know, and the whole intro and everything is kind of a homage uh, to, um, the old CBS mystery theater where that creaky door would open. And I listened to that a lot as a kid. I loved the mysteries. I loved the way that old radio show was. And it's kind of a nod to them. You know, they, they, they covered up a lot of lonely nights for me as a kid. Um, so I had a little bit all in there, you know, really all of that. Um, I really thought about it. And it's Paranormal Portal Podcast. It's just like go through here and I'm going to try to bring you everything I can possibly get my hands on, you know, um, and mostly with a lot of love and understanding. I mean, I know a lot of podcasts can make a lot of money. It's just like demons, 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 demons. <laughs> <laughs> and we have tomorrow we have demons. It's like, yeah. what's, what do you do? It's going to be Demon December. Demon, Demon December. What about yes, January? It's going to be January Demon. de- Demons. <laughs> it's going to be freaking February Flying Demons. Every yeah. month it's Demons. Demons. 
Live you know, from Bobby Mackey's. <laughs> I mean, that's just the thing. Uh, absolutely, I believe in that. You know, whatever you want to call it. I mean, there's there's good, there's evil. I'm, re- you know, that it is what it is. Okay, but what if I can reach out and put a little bit of that light back in it and say, you know what? You know, I had a visit from my cat who, you know, couldn't walk when he passed. And then I felt him walk right up the bed, no limp. I saw it. Didn't see him, but I saw the movement of the covers and stuff like that. And snuggle right up next to my husband who needed him more than anything. And then I saw my husband in his sleep kind of pat him, you know, put his hand there and didn't even realize that he did it. And to me, that was like a beautiful moment. Not only did he pass, my husband's heart was bruised, his cat, you know, our hearts were broke, but this little guy found a way to come back and bring comfort to, you know, my husband and my husband in his sleep didn't even realize he got it. It was awesome. Now, what if I can put that out there? You know, what if I can put that out there that, you know, my mother came to visit me, you know, basically I had a little kind of experience there before she died, then right after she died, and then after she finally decided to cross and come back and tell me she was she was cool and so was I. And then she found a way to come through every medium that seems to come near me. You know, they'll start talking to me. And they won't even know me. And they'll go, you know, there's this woman. And I'm like, so start laughing. I'll go, what did she say? What did she say? Tell me, tell me, you know. So that, how cool is that? That's, that's awesome. I, I think it's I think it's a wonderful way for, for me to make friends all across the world. I love podcasting. I no love doubt about it. it. I wanted to talk to these people, man. I wanted to talk to Mark Nesbitt about, you know, Gettysburg and his knowledge and pick his brain and ask him questions and, you know, uh just just all these different people and it's amazing when you give them an email or whatever and they say yeah I'll come on I'm like oh my god I get to talk to this guy you know and you know people that I've watched for like 20 years on these little shows all like sightings or in search of I mean some of them go way back you know and they're still out there it's crazy and you know? as if as if being a podcaster is not talented enough you're also into other things, and I want to talk just a minute here, because believe it or not, a half hour is almost up already. Okay. But no I, way. I swear to God, like, I'm not even kidding. Like, it's almost done. Get to the gate, man. Wickedly, wickedly wired, wear, wearable art. Yeah, that's me. Wear the art that's in your heart, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, yeah. so tell me a little tiny bit about this passion, because this kind of, this is really interesting. I, I, okay. I, I, I see people do this, and like... I never ever grasped the concept because I'm not really an artist by like drawing and stuff like that. I'm more of the more of the audible type way of doing yeah. things, I'm right? Like there's many people I have to be doing five things at once, and I was told it, it was explained to me that I'm not real good at sitting and meditating. Like I can fire gaze, like with a candle or whatever, and we're all doing that if you have a fireplace or whatever. You just sit. That's all it is. It sounds so mystical, but it's just focusing, you know. Um, and I'm not really good at doing a lot of uh, the meditations and stuff. Um, I have to like listen to something like a mystery theater or a podcast and then work with my hands to be calm. So uh-huh. I've got a lot of little side businesses going on. That's an actual business. I got my business license on that like six years ago and it does great. But I, I actually I'm a wire sculptor. So I sculpt around gemstones and things like that for the metaphysical properties <gasps> in it. Wait a second. Yeah. Wired. Oh my God. Why? You're my Fiji mermaid. <laughs> you can make me a Fiji mermaid, can't you? Sure, I could. Oh my God. You've got to make me a Fiji mermaid. Good. Okay. This Send is on my bucket list. Way. So I, I got Brian making me my Bigfoot, uh, <laughs> plaster cast. <laughs> That's funny. I need you to make me a Fiji mermaid. <laughs> I can do it. I, I have I a thing for Ripley's, believe it or not. And the shrunken heads yeah. of Fiji mermaids are just. It's just Ripley's. A shrunken head too, but you can't tell anybody. <laughs> Actually, funny story. There's a dude in Newfoundland who got caught a little while ago. Okay. And uh, the police actually caught him red-handed. And he was outside boiling bones. Oh, no. And uh, apparently he had dug up graves of like, people who have been dead for like 100 years. And oh. were boiling out the bones so he can sell the skeletons online. Oh, the karma on that. Think about oh, that. I'm not cleansing that house. No, no way, man. That, that, yeah. You're on your own. 
By the way, if you really want to get me something cool for Father's Day, ashtray. (laughs) Someone's skull is an ashtray. I can see it now, right? Yeah. Oh, God. That's crazy, man. Cisco, you're a crazy, crazy, talented person. I I, I just see – she sent me some pictures, actually, of the stuff she makes, couple like that. And I'd love to see the listeners actually go check that out. Um, I've got, like, five different outlets. I, I wrote the book. I do the podcast. Tell me a little tiny I bit do. about the book. You never mentioned the book in your, uh, Oops. yeah. Tell it's me about a, that. We are all children in the wilderness of the afterlife, a guided tour through a haunted life. And that's available on Amazon. And I wrote it with Steve Stockton. It's a little different. What I did was my mission. <laughs> it sounds like mission impossible, but it should you choose is, to accept it? <laughs> yeah. He, Steve Stockton is a wonderful guy. You should definitely have him on. He's a hoot. And he has been collecting stories all his life, very much like me at a very young age, doing the same thing I've been doing. And we met via another podcast and we started talking and I'd tell stories. He'd tell a story. My story would remind him of a story. We'd just back and forth and we'd just like paranormal chain talking, you know, for hours. <laughs> and he just kept pushing me, write a book, write a book. If you don't, the stories will die with you and you really can reach some people that are see- seeking information. So I said, okay, well, if I do it, that's what it's going to be. It's going to be exactly how it happened. No filibuster, no filler, no nothing. If I can't remember what happened between here and there, I'm going to say it, you know, but it sounded like this. It smelled like this. It happened this way. And that way other people who are reading it can go, that's what happened to me, you know, and in some way, I can reach out and maybe help somebody who was in my position, young and didn't have anybody to talk to, just seeking answers or just looking for a good story. Um, so it dots through my life and tells the different paranormal experiences I had. But I told Steve, you got to come with me. And what what I did was I would write a chapter and I would send it to him. And whatever it reminded him of, whatever he wanted to say, he wrote it after. So it's a color commentary. And I didn't change a word that he wrote. And that's how the book is laid out. It's really different. I like it. It came out great. I'm proud of it. Well, yet another feather in the cap of Cisco Murdoch. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I try to stay busy. You know, I do uh, vintage dream catchers. I make all kind of canopies and stuff like that. That's another thing I do. And then now I'm flipping furniture. So, you know, who knows what I'll be doing next week. But I do it all at the same time, you know. Oh, my God. We've, yeah, we've got to do this Fiji mermaid thing. I can't, I can't stop thinking of it now. I can, like my dream is to have my own podcasting studio here in my house. Right now I'm relegated to the, to, to the closet, <laughs> which is a great place to podcast, by the way. Your own Bigfoot. Yeah. Yeah. Like I want my own room and I want to have Fiji mermaids in there and, and Bigfoot plaster cast. I just want it to be cool in there. I want it to be I me. Can, <laughs> I can, I could weave just about anything when oh it comes God. to that. Give me enough wire. It's, it's funny because I've had people ask me to make them the oddest things, but you know, um, if it wants to be made, it'll, you know, it'll come most of the time at copper. I work a lot with copper wire because it's such a conduit of energy. So if you've got any gemstones or, you know, amethyst or something like that in there, it really is a great conduit. You know, it's great. I'm excited. And it helps people. <laughs> I'm excited. Yeah, and yes, people. I will pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> it helps people, you know, that's cool. I'm, I'm trying to reach out and help as much as I can. You know, I think if you've got this kind of knowledge, I mean, there's no way I could ever, you know, I always wanted to be like a history teacher or something like that. And I got that dream. I homeschooled my boys, uh, you know, from the third and fifth grade on. And that was great. And History was like my favorite subject. And we got really deep into it. And, taught them how to make their own ink and their own quills and how to sign, you know, their name like they did in the Declaration of Independence and stuff. I got very deep into it. It was so rewarding. And now, you know, I want to reach out and teach, you know, a little bit, at least not so much teach, but say, this is what happened to me. You're not alone, you know. Um, and these things do happen to people. And it's not all, you know, just provoking if you're going to a house and doing things like this or you know it's you know ghosts were people too man you know so i communicate with i can communicate with the ones who have crossed over i can't hear the ones that have it crossed over cannot explain that 
but I can communicate through uh, other means, like say dousing rods, or um, if I have a, a medium with me, it's like he's saying yes, or now they have all this equipment, and I've got some fantastic adventures, you know, pretty much with with things like that. But when you sit down and you talk to a ghost, and you got their attention, and they're willing to to communicate it as best they can with you, and you feel that you know, their angst, their um, fear or their wanting, you know, why are they there? Are you confused? What's going on with you? It's no different than you walking down a street and you see a man in a hole, you know, are you just going to stand there and say, here, let me get you on recording. Or, you know, if you knock three times on the wall, you know, and then run off and tell your friends that you got three knocks on the wall. No, you get down on your, belly and you put your hand out you go reach for my hand i got you that is a human being dead or alive that's a human being that's how i feel about it there you go some sage advice to all the ghost hunters out there once again my guest tonight was cisco murdoch you can check her out at through the gate journey through the gate dot libson dot com check out her podcast and of course uh you know get in there give her a listen Cisco did really, really well. <laughs> Thank you. We did. We also have a great group on Facebook too. It's a uh, paranormal. Uh, it's the Paranormal Portal Podcast Gatekeepers. It's this whole name of the podcast, and you can come in there and talk to some great sage people uh, that have been there for a long time. And please come over and join us. And feel free to post, you know, your podcast on there. Um, answer questions, share pictures, whatever. Yeah. It's just a little community that tries to reach out and help. You oh know, man, I'd, like I'd, what we can do. I'd really love to do that myself. I, uh, yes. I'll make sure I put this episode up there. That's for sure. <laughs> well, thank you. It's been wonderful being with you. It went way too fast. Can we get, maybe we can do part two. You come over. Oh, can you say that one last part one more time? I got cut off. Sorry. <laughs> I said, why don't I said, it's been great talking to you. We could continue. We could do part two and you can come over on my podcast and we can talk some more. Ooh, I sounds like it. fun. Yes. Got, got anybody for Halloween yet? Uh, not anybody alive. <laughs> well, maybe you should get the EV. Maybe you should get the EVP researcher on. I'd love to come over. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so funny. We have great fun here at Halloween. It's just great to be in this, isn't it? It's just wonderful, and I love I love all the listeners and you know and all my friends that are podcasters and just it's just a great thing to be involved in it's wonderful well the time to say goodbye is upon us but don't worry you can keep track of the odd the new for land paranormal podcast very easily it's available on stitcher itunes podbean and tune in radio just look for the odd the new for land paranormal podcast banner of course if you'd like to keep up to date you can always check out the odd the new for land paranormal podcast facebook page drop a like And every single time a new show goes up, you'll be notified. You can also follow me, John Mallard, on Twitter at O-D-D-T-O-N-F-L-D. That's odd to Newfoundland. From the oldest city in North America, I bid you adieu. From the odd to Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast.